So now we're ready to discuss our Simple Pi program and why it sucks. So just to remind you, here is the code of the Serial Pi program that we start with. And uh, to any of you who've done anything with C, this should look pretty straightforward and simple. So here is my version of it, of, of the Pi program. And I'm going to walk you through everything I did and explain it as I go. What I'm using is an algorithm strategy called the SPMD algorithm strategy. So this is very, very commonly used in parallel computing. The idea is I have a single program and I run multiple copies of that program. And so each thread has its own copy. But it's going to use the ID of the thread and knowledge of how many threads there are to adjust and change what it does. So now look at the code. I'm going to have to set up the request for the number of threads, OMP set num threads. Then I have my pragma OMP parallel, and then I'm going to declare some, in, some data that's going to be local to each thread. And then I go through and I split up loop iterations between threads. All right, so I want to first describe that before I go any further, because there's a number of ways to do this. I did the easy cheat way. It's called a cyclic distribution of the loop iterations. What I did is I started at the loop index equal to the ID. I left the limit of the loop the same, that the loop index was less than the number of steps. And then I incremented the loop index variable by the number of threads. I equals I plus uh, the number of threads. Now, what this is, it's just like dealing out a deck of cards, right? Thread number zero got, let's say there were four threads. Thread number zero got iteration zero and four and eight and 12. Thread number one got iteration one and five. So this is a really, really easy way. It's a cyclic distribution. We sometimes also call this a round robin distribution, or you can think of it as dealing out a deck of cards. But what you can notice is, is I didn't have to make a lot of changes to the loop in order to give each thread a subset of the iterations to compute. Now, another thing I want to talk about is the threads had to have some local data they were working on. They had to be able to know that they could make changes to things like the ID, like its value of the step size at the middle, like the loop control variable. They needed to have their own copies of those. So notice the number of threads, the ID, the loop control index, the double for the, where the center of the loop was, I declared those inside the parallel region so they would sit on the stack for each thread. Very, very critical. I hope you all got that. All right, now here's the tricky part. Outside the parallel region, I've lost those variables inside the thread stack. At the end of the parallel region, the threads go away, except for the master thread. So that means if I sum up the value of that summation inside the parallel region, how does it get out for me to do something with it when it's done? That has to be shared. The sum variable somehow has to be shared so that it can be visible after the parallel region's done. Well, my goodness, what am I going to do? Because each thread has to have its own value of sum so they don't step all over each other. Remember the whole race condition problem? So I couldn't use one value of sum in this program. I had to give each thread its own sum. What was the solution? I used a very common trick. I promoted the scalar sum to an array. So in the original program, I had the variable I was summing into called sum, and it was a scalar. What I did is I left it shared, and I made it an array, and I left, I allocated enough space on that array for the maximum number of threads. So I set a number of threads, in this case, pound defined num threads two. I then, when I allocated the sum array, I created array indices, I, I, I created an array large enough for the number of threads. So now inside my loop, I index that array by the thread ID. So now when I'm done and I get to the end of the program, I have an array with the partial sum from each thread. And then I can sum that all up and off I go. All right, so, phew, one more thing I have to talk about. All right, the number of threads. If you look in this piece of code, I had one thread, if id equals zero, so the master thread, saved a copy of the number of threads. And notice in that code, n threads was declared outside the parallel region so that it would be visible after the parallel region was done. This is a real subtle point, folks, but we've got to go through this and understand. 
when you enter a parallel region in OpenMP, you request a number of threads. But an environment can choose to give you fewer threads. So I actually have to check how many threads I got. So that's why I picked one thread, doesn't matter which one I picked, but I picked one of the threads to say, hey, will you copy the number of threads you got, we have to work with inside the parallel region? Will you copy that into the shared variable? Because that way I'll know how many there were when we get out. So that's why I had that little if id equals zero and threads equals the, the number of threads inside the parallel region. This may seem really irritating and weird to you. I mean, if I ask for four threads, stupid computer, give me four threads. But what if I asked for 4,000 threads? What if I asked for 4 million threads? What if it's a shared resource and there's 128 processors on there and I'm going to be a greedy bastard and I'm going to use all those processors for me and I don't care what everyone else gets. So I'm going to go through and ask for 256 threads and I'll just screw everyone else. Well, no, system administrators may say, you only have 16 threads maximum. There's all these reasons that you may want the API to give you fewer threads than you asked for. So that's why I had to go through there and have that little construct to get the number of threads in case it was fewer. Now, when I ran this on my uh, Apple laptop uh, with a dual core processor in it, and each processor of those dual core processors had a pair of hardware threads, I ran the sequential version of the program and it ran in 1.83 seconds. When I ran in parallel on one thread, it ran in 1.86 seconds. Now, you may be going, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Why would the OpenMP program on one thread run slower than the non-OpenMP program? And of course, as you think about it, you know, I'm still setting up a runtime environment. I'm still creating a thread in the middle of my program. There's extra stuff that happens. It's actually normal that your parallel program on one thread will be a little bit slower than the purely serial program not running with any of that parallel overhead. So then I add the two threads and it goes down to 1.03. So, eh, you know, I would love it if it went in half. I would love it if it was, you know, 0 0.9. But still, that's not too bad. Then I go to three threads and it's 1.08. And I go to four threads and it's 0 0.97. The scalability of this program sucks. It really does. And do any of you think you know why it sucks? Of course you don't. If you're taking this course, you don't know parallel programming. So you don't know why, so let me tell you. It's called false sharing, and this picture here summarizes it perfectly. You know, I had that sum array. I promoted sum into an array, and that got around this problem of each thread needed a way to store its partial sums, but all of those partial sums had to be visible outside. All right, so I had to do that in this algorithm. But now think about it. They're not sharing. Each thread has its own little piece of the array, but we have a cache. We have a cache line. What if those array elements happen to sit on the same cache line? And frankly, given the, uh, the Intel processor this was running on, I can pretty darn near guarantee you they're sitting on the same cache line. So think about it. Thread zero comes in and it writes its element. And then thread number two comes in, it writes its element, happens to be on the same cache line, right? So it's ready to do the write. It has to send out a cache protocol message saying, invalidate that copy because I'm about to write. So what you do is you get the cache line sloshing back and forth. We call this false sharing because there truly is no sharing. There, there is no shared data conflict. It, but because they happen to be in the same cache line, even though I'll get the right answer, I get this horrible performance hit due to bouncing the cache lines back and forth. This is called false sharing. There's a way around it, and it's ugly. But here's what it is. In this version of the code, you can see that I added a little array block called pad. And that padded array block, now it's a two-dimensional array, and it's padded it so it's got the, you know, by the number of threads, is the first dimension, which is what I had before, and then I've added this little thing called pad, and then I set pad to be the number of double precision words in a cache line. All right, so now I guarantee that if I'm always grabbing pad, the, the second element zero, but the first one's gonna be indexed by the ID, I now guarantee that as I go to each successive element in the array, they're sitting on a different um, cache line. Uh, and when I do that, uh, my performance, it goes from 1.86 to 1.01 to 0 0.69 to 0 0.53. So that got around the, the performance problem 
of the false sharing. Now, of course, you may look at that and go, that was ugly. I mean, you expect me to know the size of the cache line? You expect me every time I move this piece of software to another machine to figure out the size of the cache line and readjust the pad? So this solution works, and performance-oriented programmers kind of need to learn about this stuff, but it's an ugly solution. And what I'm going to be showing you in the next module is how to solve this problem in a much more elegant, much more uh, portable way using synchronization.